Well, thank you and good evening. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the final event in our 2016 Crossbows Chamber Music Festival. Um, I think I probably know many of you, but for those who I haven't met, my name is Bridie Bartleet and I'm the director of the Cons Research Centre. And it's my great pleasure to be here with you tonight. I'd like to begin tonight by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we are gathered for this evening, but also the entire Crossbows Festival, and to pay my respect to elders past and present. Now, since Friday, Crossbows has showcased an incredible program of innovative repertoire, and it's given us one of those really rare opportunities to experience collaborative performances from all departments side by side. Don't ask me which ones were the best, it's too hard to tell, but I'm sure you'll agree if you've been here with us, it's been an absolute treat. Now, as the festival is drawing to a close tonight, I'd like to take this moment to say a few quick thank yous. First of all, a very big thank you to our wonderful artistic director, Peter Luff. <laughs> Peter has assembled a terrific team around him, and of course, our big thanks to all of the front and back of house staff, and to all of the faculty and students who've performed so willingly in this program. You've made it shine, and you've made it so special. Thanks also to Mikhail Rosiak, to Natalie Lewandowski, and of course to our wonderful conservatorium director, Professor Scott Harrison, for your continued assistance and support. And thanks to those who've supported us as audience members. I think, well, this weekend has been amazing. It's fair to say that we've saved the best till last. And tonight is a very special night with our guest Paul Dean and his collaborators. Now, Paul Dean needs no introduction to many of you. Of course, he's very well known as a brilliant soloist, a recitalist, artistic director, and a teacher, a much loved teacher. But tonight, we're going to see him in his dual roles as composer and chamber musician, which is, of course, very fitting for the end of the Crossbows Festival. He's, of course, artistic director of the Four Winds Festival and the Tutti Beijing International Youth Music Festival, and was also the founder of the wonderful Southern Cross soloists, the Bangalore Music Festival, and the Sunwater and Stanwell Winter Music School. He's literally performed with every imaginable orchestra, and there's far too many to mention here. And he's also a proud member of the Endeavour Trio and the Skullthorpe Wind Quintet. Of course, he was formerly the artistic director of ANAM until he made the very wise decision to ditch that terrible climate in that boring place down south and decided to move up here to the very sunny culture capital of Australia. And of course, he's now our much admired head of woodwind. So tonight we have the wonderful opportunity of not only hearing Paul play alongside his colleagues, but also hearing him talk about some of his compositions. And I believe tonight we have some Queensland premieres too. And he's joined by a wonderful lineup of musicians who he's soon going to introduce. Would you please join me in making Paul Dean most welcome? Thank you, and thank you very much for being here. It's an extremely humbling occasion. Of course, a, a night of um, all your music is a narcissist's dream. Um, and uh, one that I don't expect will happen too often, so I intend to enjoy it. Um, of course, it's extremely humbling that these wonderful musicians that are here um, playing my music tonight have all um, given so much to all the rehearsals and, and the many, many, many hours of practice that they've put into. And I know certainly uh, one pianist who told me that they spent three hours on three bars. Um, surely the piano's not that hard. Anyway, um, we're going to hear three of my pieces um, tonight and we're going to hear them in reverse chronological order. We're going to start with uh, one of my latest pieces, or certainly the latest piece in the program, and this was written in the summer of 2014-15. Um, this was a, a time in my life where I was 
de actually deciding whether to, uh, to actually leave Ann Am and um, take the, take the uh, role of head of winds at this particular uh, institution. And uh, I spent five weeks on my own looking after Stephen Emerson's house while he went, he went off to Europe and gallivant and listened to lots of Wagner. And uh, in many ways, it was a really important time in my life as a composer because um, I spent every day and every, certainly every morning uh, writing music, which was a new experience for me, had, having been busy in, at Anam. Um, so in many ways, I owe the, this piece to uh, Stephen's dog, Cooper, who sat at my feet while I wrote it. However, that's got nothing to do with the mood of the particular piece. Um, I'm very grateful that he has such an extremely uh, rich um, library of poetry. And I was commissioned to write this piece for the two people that you're going to hear perform it this evening, Andrew Goodwin, tenor, and Daniel Gabor, a piano. And uh, I spent a lot of time looking for the poetry that was going, I was going to use. Writing a song cycle was... This was my second song cycle, and I'd, I'd felt that the first one, I'd let myself down with the choice of poetry in some ways. So in many ways, it, it uh, became the most important thing was to, for me to get the poetry right, whether I did or not, I guess it was your decision. Um, I started with the last of the three poems, which is called The Farewell by Tennyson, and in many ways reflected very much the state of my mind and my state of mind in terms of wanting to leave Melbourne. The second of the three songs that I wrote is in fact number two and it's called The Garden of Love by William Blake. I have never read a more violently unhappy poem in my life. This poem, in fact, I didn't actually really understand this poem. The funny thing I find that when I'm writing, setting poetry to music or words in general, every time I read it, it means a different thing. And I find that uh, quite confronting when I'm, I'm halfway through the song and decide that it means something else. But I don't think I really understood this poem until I heard Andrew sing it at the premiere in February of 2015. Um, he's obviously extraordinarily unhappy with the church. And I'll let you read into the poem whatever it is you want to read into it. The first poem was, took a long time to find. Um, but in the end, I chose Invictus by Henley. And the last lines of this poem um, became a bit of a mantra of mine for the next few months following um, discovering this poem. I'd like to welcome two fabulous musicians to the stage to perform um, this uh, song cycle, which I've promptly forgotten the name. Ah, that's right, Beyond This Place of Blood and Tears. Which is, a, which is a line from the Henley poem. I'd like you to welcome Andrew Goodwin and Daniel Deborah.
Thank you very much to Andrew and Daniel. That's a spectacular performance. Like, as a composer, you write these notes and you don't ever expect anyone's going to play them or sing them. Certainly not that well, so thank you very much. Uh, the next piece was premiered about a month before I started that particular piece, and it's called Three Intimate Interludes for Cello and Piano. Uh, this was a commission by Kathy Selby and friends uh, for a tour with the great Swedish cellist Torleif Thedin, um, who toured with Kathy in October 2014. And uh, this piece is actually a really important one for me in many ways. Uh, came at a t uh, I started writing this piece at a particularly um, unhappy time in my life. And I did quite a lot of research, not only into um, cello and piano music and solo cello music, but I also did quite a lot of research into how other composers had um, so-called used their bad moments to write their best music. Um, and uh, it turns out that uh, we're all a happy lot, really. Um, Marla, he was pretty cheerful. Um, so um, this, this piece has three movements. And the first is called Conflict, and it's very much, you will, you'll get the aggression and the anger between, um, probably between not only the, uh, the two instruments, but, but between the, uh, the cello and the right hand and the left hand. Um, so it's a three-way um, three unhappiness. Um, the second movement is probably actually the most passionate thing I've, I've written to date. And um, I guess I took a lot of inspiration from Shostakovich, another very happy composer. Um, absolute huge fan of the Shostakovich cello sonata and of course, um, having just read a book called Steel Like an Artist, I wasn't uh, too shy in um, using certainly not his harmony but his textures in this particular movement. And the last movement, which starts with a cello cadenza, is called Isolation. I'm very, very um, grateful for the two people who have put this piece together in just under, I sent them the music just under two weeks ago, um, and it's a fearful little number. Um, but I'd very much like you to welcome Trish O'Brien and Kevin Power. Thank you.
This is the last piece, and in many ways, the very first piece that I ever wrote, um, and certainly the very first serious piece I ever wrote. I um, composed it for Jack Liebeck, the English violinist, and the Southern Cross soloist in 2008. And it takes the form of a chamber concerto um, for violin and ensemble. Um, continuing on the really cheerful note of these pieces tonight, um, this, this, this piece was written in memory of the um, 350 people who drowned aboard the Sea Vex when it um, came into difficulty. It was a refugee boat in um, 2001 off the coast of Western Australia and all but 16 um, people on the board um, perished. And I remember thinking at the time, of course, of the Tampa crisis and how, um, how much we treat deaths as numbers and the news would just say, oh, 350 people died as if it was a cricket score. And I was deeply offended by not only the media coverage but the Australian response to this unbelievable tragedy. Funnily enough, when I wrote this piece in 2008, I thought that maybe this would uh, stop being a story, refugees and asylum seekers. And of course now it is, is more a story and more of a tragedy than ever before in human history. It's, this is not necessarily a political piece, but it's a piece that tries to understand the terror that those people suffered on board that tiny boat that night off the coast of Western Australia. It's in five movements that connect together. They are called promise, leaving, panic, loss, and silence. reminded me that there will be a question and answers um, session following the performance of this piece if you'd like to uh, interrogate me in any way.
I was starting to wonder what the inspiration was for Paul's music. And after hearing the cello um, piece, I didn't know whether to congratulate him or hug him. Obviously, a lot of pain involved. Um, any questions to kick us off? I have got a few myself, but um, does anyone want to start us off? Questions have a Paul? Well, I will start us off because one thing, uh, being a collaborator, friend, colleague of Paul Dean's over, wow, 30 years, nearly 30 years now, um, I've seen him come from the precocious young clarinetist who joined QSO, who we couldn't keep him still to see the conductor, to the uh, incredible artist that we have before us today. And, and not only is he one of the, certainly one of the greatest clarinet players, performers, exponents that I've ever come across, and he's regarded not just nationally but internationally, but he's developed into what I consider to be a unique and incredible composer. So I guess my question for Paul, seeing having been with you through all of these incarnations as a musician, as an administrator, as an artist, is where does the inspiration primarily come from? I, I'm fascinated as to what, what spark is required to create such music, you've given us a small insight, but I've, I've never written anything original in my life, so I'd, I'd love to know what it is that drives you. Some might say I've never written anything original either, Peter. <laughs> um, look, this is the, the, the great question of composers. Um, I, I find that um, Abyss was the first piece that I ever wrote, and it was also the only piece I ever wrote um, onto manuscript. Um, the rest has been on Sibelius, which I find even actually much harder in some ways. Um, but usually it's an emotive, it certainly starts usually as an emotive response to a specific thing like Abyss was to my, I had to write this piece of music and it just so happened that at that time this particular story broke and it, it, it got me so angry and emotional that I, I, I mean, it's funny, you're not going to do any good to anyone or, or bring those refugees back to life and it, but in a sense it, it was my paying homage to the fact of what they'd been through was enough to uh, make that spark for me and then it was obviously the inspiration of the, the performers that were going to play at the first performance and most of the time when I write music I, 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 I imagine sitting in the, the audience watching and I imagined um, Southern Cross, which was a group, of course, that I knew very well, but I also imagined Jack standing there playing. And I, I, I guess it sounds a little corny to say that I listen when I'm watching or I've got this vision of what's going on before me, but the, the personalities, I guess, in many ways of, of the players that I'm, I'm working with. Um, I unfortunately write way too hard clarinet parts, but um, you get that. And speaking of the violin playing, huge congratulations to Graham Jennings. Unbelievable playing. I know Graham's still here. <laughs> Extraordinary. And uh, we were fortunate to perform with two of our students. Yes, students. Nicole Mizurak and um, Matthew Ventura. Uh, it was fantastic to have them on stage with us this evening, I have to say. So um, that, that's, that's the, the basic thing. I think for the songs it was a case that I was at Stephen's place and I had a grand piano to sit and fiddle with. Um, and and I, I worked out a series of chords and structures of the songs by sitting at the piano, which is quite rare because I don't, I don't spend that much time at the piano and probably not, not enough time. But that, that was written basically at the piano. So you spent the best part of 10 years more uh, as principal clarinet with the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. Um, how did that inform your compositional style, do you think? Uh, that's a good question because um, it's like sitting in an orchestration handbook, particularly where I was sitting right in the middle of what was going on. And I used to keep a notebook. Unfortunately, I lost this notebook many years ago, but I, I kept a note of everything that I thought was just way too clever to miss out on. And the composers that were generally the ones that inspired me were Stravinsky, Mahler, Ravel, Hindemith, which we played a lot of, as you remember, in the early 90s, um, and Puccini, which, of course, we played every year. Um, and just, it'd be little things like 
every time Puccini changes the harmony, he would just gently tap the bass drum. Not that anyone in the audience would know, but sitting in the orchestra, you'd know, and of course, you'd miss it if it wasn't there. But it just gave everything this little bit of a glow. And I d it was just little things like that that I used to take notes from. And um, those five composers in particular, I would go home and I, I wasn't writing anything particular, but I, it would always inspire me to, to write something or, or something or other. And of course, uh, living and, and, and growing up with, with an, another composer was, was a big um, inspiration as well. And, and because, I mean, Brett started writing music when he was a teenager and I just thought it was, you know, and it was interesting to watch that process so close. I mean, he was writing, you know, Juvenilia at, at the time, but it was, that was an important thing for, for me to, to see how that process worked. And, and I, I worked, of course, we both have worked with many Australian composers very, very closely and watching the first rehearsals and watching pieces develop um, all courses are the fascinating and, and uh, inspiring process on its own. You made reference today in our rehearsal of um, the influence of Coldplay. Yeah, <laughs> embarrassing, <laughs> right? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> um, well Coldplay have this thing that when they write a song, they never bring the bass line in until absolutely necessary. And my kids loved Coldplay, and it seemed that I, every road trip that I did, I had to listen to bloody Viva La Vida and all of that stuff. But I mean, they, they were master songwriters and master manipulators. The, the great pop songs are, are manipulations of, of your emotions, and virtually no one did it better than them. And the way they would wait a minute and a half before the bass drum, or um, before the bass guitar or the, the bottom of the piano came in. And of course, that's how Abyss starts. As you notice, there's nothing in the, in the bass clef at all for about three minutes until Matt plays that note in the bassoon, which is the lowest note in the bassoon. So move over Mozart, bring on Coldplay. <laughs> Folks, we'll open up for questions from the audience. Yes, there's one right in the middle in the back there, thanks. And the microphone is coming your way. Hello, can you hear? Oh, you can hear me. Okay. I've got two questions for you, Paul. Um, one, speaking as a non-composer, um, how is it that you, like, transfer your emotions into a musical score without losing, like, the original ideas that you had? And second of all, in regards to the last piece that you played, in, rega in regards to the Asylum Seekers, I'm interested in how you got the idea of, or, well, your hatred of um, one, the idea that one death is a tragedy, yet a million deaths is merely a statistic. Um, okay. It, it's an interesting question because when you've got that initial emotional spark, you then have to write a piece of music and you can't write every bar thinking about what, it, what pl role that has to play in, in, in a piece of music. And in many ways, and I notice this now that I use Sibelius, um, is that, and, and having read a lot of um, how authors write their books, is that in many ways the music takes on a life of its own and sometimes it takes you off on this wild and you end up deleting, you know, 35 bars, which is a very depressing pressing of the button. But um, you, you, in a way you let the music live for itself and... I guess one of the really lucky things about being a performer and, and a composer is that I've sat in the middle of all, m most of the great orchestral pieces ever written. So you get a sense of how, and, and, and in no way do I think I've got this yet, but I'm, I'm hoping one day I will, is that you, you get a sense of what happens next and you get a sense of how they build and build and build and build. And, and when you sit in a Bruckner or a Mahler symphony or a Strauss tone poem, you, you're blown away by the, the patience they have. I recently wrote an oboe concerto and I was quite happy with the slow movement and it was three and a half minutes. And, and then I listened to Bruckner 7 and the slow movement's 27. And how, the, and it's, it's much more interesting than my oboe concerto. And he just, the way he uses that material in such a, a refined and patient way is, is really inspiring. I'm going off the subject here, but um, I think overall in a piece like Abyss, there was a sense that the piano and the clarinet started at the, uh, at the beginning and that was the water and the sound of the, the bubbling water and the, and the motor and 
And then the, the whole, uh, the whole uh, architecture of that piece was based on the fact that this boat broke down and water came on board and there was mass panic. Um, so in, in 15 minutes, you know, I'm telling a story that took hours. So I guess you do, the, the emotional content can have a huge impact on the, on the musical content. But I try, try to let as much as possible the musical content have a, um, um, have a life of its own. As far as the other uh, more emotional um, question, um, I guess the thing that really um, always struck me about Australian news, and, uh, and it's news that happens everywhere in the world, but there's a tragedy uh, which happens you know, on a daily basis. And they'll say 88 people died, but there were no Australians um, or you know, whatever. You know, th there's that sense that, oh, well, there was no Australians. There's a sense in Austra Australian media, you know, that, that, that our lives are worth more than anyone else's or one, one life, you know. It, it, it always confuses me, that, that whole issue of statistics around, um, you know, catastrophes. Um, that doesn't really answer your question, but I'll talk to you about it in your lesson. <laughs> and do we have any further questions, please? Any other hands? Yes, there's two more in the front here, so we'll take the young lady first and then... In Justin, second, thank you. It is Justin. I think it's Justin. Well, yes, it is one. Um, my question is more specific um, for the for the last piece. I wanted to know. Um, I'm not entirely sure what what the technique is called, but in the violin, where you've got the same note but different fingering, um, I wanted to know if there was an, a specific symbolic reasoning behind writing that way having the same note but different fingerings? Um, I've written 35 pieces since I wrote Abyss and I can't remember. Uh. I suspect it was the fact that I really liked the sound. Um, I, uh, there, there may well, I mean that whole um, cadenza is basically a survivor in the water looking out for others. You know, and, and I always felt that the changing the strings for the same note, going up obviously higher on the lower strings, has a, has a, a real sobbing and, and really ultimately incredibly melancholic sound to it, particularly when you get onto the G string. Um, and I suspect that, uh, that it had a lot to do with that. It, it seems to me that it amplified the despair. Now, listening backstage... Well, I was listening, actually, because uh, I've got the score in front of me. But um, as the timbre changes up the string, it really seemed to uh, heighten the, the sense of loss, the sense yeah, of Yeah, well, it's that, that sense that the sound becomes more muffled yeah. and more distant and more, more uh, sobbing, I guess you could say. But anyway, it's a, thank you for that question. I'm glad someone noticed that I, I attempted to write for a string instrument with some degree of intelligence. Hi, Paul. Um, Hello, Justin. <laughs> um, what is art for you? How, how would you define it and how do you teach it? How long <laughs> so, no more questions? <laughs> oh, Justin. Um, that, that's, um, I can't answer that question. Certainly not in, in two minutes. Um, but I guess to, to me, art is an emotional response or it's an emotional um, creation, um, be it theatre, poetry, visual art, dance, theatre, any, any form of the arts and every, every strand of every str form of, of that. As it's, uh, to me, art is, is a reflection on our society um, and that's one of the reasons why I was so interested in, in writing a piece about asylum seekers, I guess. Uh, it should reflect both uh, well and should question society's values. It always has, and I think it always should. Um, I think in this modern time, we've lost the sense of that a little bit. And, we're, and in, and in so-called art music or classical music, we have... We have become very, um, very conservative in the way that we program, and we like very much the familiar. 
and I struggle with that. I mean, I, I as I said, I listen to Bruckner and Mahler and, and Mendelssohn and Bach and Mozart, and I listen to you guys play this music all the time as well, and it, it means no less to me. But I think there's a, there's a real danger that our, our particular brand of art, which is music, is, is um, it's not dying, but without, without composers and musicians playing the music of today, it ceases to live in the same way that it perhaps was living 100 years ago or 200 years ago or even 50 years ago. So um, to me, art is, is that. It's, it's a reflection on, on society good and bad. Mm. And if we look through history at some of the great pieces, I mean Shostakovich V is a great example of a piece of music that was a reaction to the fact that he was hauled over the coals by Stalin. And Scott talked about the fact that there was a 40 minute ovation afterwards. And yet the, the joke was the fact that he was poking fun at Stalin in that piece in the end. It, it was... Um, his traditional march, as John Gilpert used to call it, the march to the gasworks finale, and of Shostakovich. It was in incredibly ironic and sarcastic. And that was a great reflection on, on and it's autom autobiographical, that piece of music, if you look at where it comes. So it, we, I can't answer in, in shorter words than to say that I think it's a reflection of our society. Folks, I think we have time for only one more question before we wrap it up. Does anyone have a, a final question for Paul? There's one there. Yeah. Where? Oh, yes, just Jacob. Hello. Um, you mentioned at the start of the cello and piano duet that you, in a way, researched the cello and looked at Shostakovich for... Um, for tips and ways on how to write it. So I was just wondering, in general, how much time do you spend looking at a particular instrument, researching it, um, figuring out all its different idiomatic functions? Well, perhaps if you talk to the cellist, you'd probably say, I didn't look at it at all. <laughs> the um, horn player says he has no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like um, I spend... I, I, earlier that year, I'd ha also written a piece for solo cello, and I'd researched the the Bach um, solo suites, of course, which I heard every day at Anam anyway, and the Ligeti solo p suite uh, or solo sonata, and the Kadai solo piece, um, and also the Ludoslowski concerto, and and so I'd study. I, I mean, I'd study the music. I'd looked at the scores. Um, there's always that sort of game within my head, can I write something that maybe somebody else hasn't written? And of course, you, you never really do that because most of the time uh, it hasn't been written because it's stupid. Mm. Um, but I, I, try to, I try to get inside the sound of the instrument that I'm particularly writing. And of course, the, the beginning and the end of Abyss, which was the, for the horn, was, was written for Peter because... I'd spent, you know, two decades sitting beside him. I knew exactly where his weakness, where his strengths were. <laughs> um, we'll edit that out of the. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess I guess it's you, you. Well, I don't know if, if it's a general thing for a composer, but as a composer, I try and find what that voice means to me the cello or the horn or the oboe or whatever the instrument or the violin. I try and... You know, I grew up in a house where I probably heard the Mendelssohn and Tchaikovsky violin concerto and the Dvorak cello concerto from way before I could walk. Um, so I felt... I felt, you know, I, sometimes I, I feel at one with the instruments. I, I don't say that, that in any way egotistically or I write well for these instruments, but I, I, I feel like I, I, I understand the persona of the instruments, I guess, is the best thing. Um, I've got a long way to go with my idiomatic writing, I know, but um, particularly perhaps my uh, my piano writing, but uh, we won't ask Daniel about that. I think if I can weigh in on that, if we think back to music that's been written in the last, I guess, 50 years, 50, 60 years ago, players were saying, it's impossible, we can't do that. 
get a lot of those pieces in our mainstream works that we play quite comfortably. Rite of Spring, for example, uh, the Strauss First Horn Concerto, Richard Strauss's father, Franz, said it was impossible. Too many high notes, and now it's a standard first-year piece. So I think you challenging us is not such an issue, Mr. Dean. Uh, folks, um, and, and Paul, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you, listen to your, your new works, which I haven't heard. I particularly adored the song cycles. They were absolutely terrific. Um, and it's a, a privilege for us to have you back in Brisbane. And on behalf of everybody here tonight, I'd like to thank you so much for your time. Peter knows when he talks to me, I have always got to have the last word. Um, no, you but don't. <laughs> um, it's, uh, as I said, it's a narcissist's night out um, to have a concert of your own music, and it, it, uh, it's a really terrific honour. But I have to say, I'm incredibly humbled by the musicians who played tonight. It was um, an extraordinary night, and uh, I'm desperate to get home and finish my latest trio now. Thank you. <laughs>